And we are on the air. Hello, friends. Welcome to Code Mentor Office Hours. Uh, my name is Mark. Uh, we're really excited today to have uh, a really in-depth session on kind of a new technology that we haven't directly covered in, in Office Hours. Um, and our guest today is Jack Franklin. So I'm going to give Jack a little introduction, and uh, then he's going he's gonna to give us an awesome presentation going over ES6. Um, and this whole time, uh, feel free to jump in to group chat, or if you're, you're in the other room, uh, use uh, the Q&A app, and I'll be moderating questions, and we'll hit them at the end. But uh, without further ado, you know, Jack Franklin is the author of the book, Beginning jQuery. Uh, the book aims to guide a JavaScript and jQuery novice through to a level at which they're comfortable writing their own plugins. Um, Jack was also asked by Adi Osmani to contribute to his Backbone Fundamentals book, a book that was published by O'Reilly. Um, it's also free on the internet. Um, and Jack helped write the chapter on using Backbone and required JS specifically. He also runs the popular JavaScript Playground blog on which he writes tutorials about a variety of JavaScript topics including ES6, Gulp, Node, and more. Uh, he's currently a developer over at Go Cardless and is a regular writer for .NET which is the largest web development magazine over in the UK. Uh, he wrote the JavaScript gallery section for a number of months and on JavaScript topics, including a recent cover feature on JavaScript libraries. Uh, Jack's joining us from London today. He'll be talking about ES6, so everybody can quietly welcome Jack. And uh, <laughs> without further ado, uh, take it away. Cool. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for the intro. And hey, everyone. Uh, it's really great to be here, uh, coming from a surprisingly sunny London uh, for pretty much the first day this year. So. Yeah, so I guess I just need to go ahead and share my screen. Um, oh, this is, I've not done this before, let's go for that. Cool, so can we see the screen, Mark, is that? Uh, yes. Is that yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, so as Mark said, my name's Jack. I'm a Ruby and JavaScript developer at a company called Go Cardless in the UK. Um, and today I just want to kind of talk through a few of the the new features coming to ECMAScript 6, uh, which is the new version of, of JavaScript that's kind of the specification has, has hit a good stage. It's kind of most of it is confirmed. There's a few minor details to, to kind of be finalized, but generally this stuff is at a stage where you can start learning it today without any fear that the specification is going to change um, by any any kind of great great level. Um, you may have heard of it as ECMAScript 2015. Uh, it's just been renamed from ES6 to ES2015. Um, which I know is kind of I find find it a bizarre decision because ES6 is such like a well-known kind of term and phrase, but the idea is generally that there's going to be a release a year roughly, so kind of naming them based on the year makes more sense. Uh, and the ES6 ES6 spec is I believe set to be entirely confirmed and kind of finalised by June, uh, but a lot of the kind of smaller specs that make up the the whole of ES6 have already been confirmed. So so a bunch of stuff already is is starting to be added to browsers, but it's definitely at a stage where you can play with it. Uh, so what I'd like to do today is talk through some of the new features, but then also spend a bit of time talking about how you can actually start to use this stuff now. Um, we're at a stage where a lot of tools have been developed that let you write ES6 and and kind of have tools make that work in the browsers today. So there's really it's, this isn't one of those JavaScript talks where I'll show you a bunch of stuff and you can't use it for months and months and months. You really can start working with this stuff today. And the application I work on uh, at GoCardless, we, we use a ton of the ES6 features too, and it's kind of working and in production, and, and it's all working really well, so we're really pleased with it. Uh, so yeah, so my name is Jack Franklin, that's that's me on Twitter, if you if you care to follow me, and the company I work for is GoCardless, and we're a, we're a payments processing company. Uh, the standard we are hiring applies here too, so do let me know if you want to come write Ruby or JavaScript. Um, so yeah, so back to back to JavaScript. Um, effectively, what I want to do is just take you through lots and lots of functions. Uh, the ES6 spec is pretty large. There's quite a lot going on. I haven't got more than kind of 30 minutes or so to, to talk now, uh, so I can't cover everything in great detail. But I'll try to kind of give you a broad overview of what I think are the the nice the nicest bits of the language. Um, and we're going to start with arrow functions. So. Currently in JavaScript, well, there's lots of uh, functions like map for each. Uh, we use them in callbacks a lot. We we take we have functions that take other functions as arguments, and this is the kind of syntax you would use uh, these days. So you would you take map and you give it an anonymous function that takes some argument, and you you kind of return x times two. And this is going to take my array of numbers and return me a new array where every number in it has been doubled. So I'll get back two, four, six. This is kind of this works, uh, but it's it's fairly verbose. And particularly, I work a lot in Ruby, and in Ruby we have a much nicer syntax. We don't have any of this long kind of function keyword. Uh, it's much more succinct, and kind of you can express yourself really nicely. 
And that's really what arrow functions bring to JavaScript. They bring a much more succinct, uh, nice approach for writing these kind of functions where you, you have a function like map that takes in a, another function as its argument. You can kind of express the intent and what's, what's going on much clearer. The key things to notice here, um, the function keyword has gone, obviously. It's been replaced with, by what's being deemed a fat arrow. Uh, so it's like a, a fat arrow function. If any of you are familiar with CoffeeScript, you've probably seen this before in other guises too. CoffeeScript has a thin and fat arrow syntax. Uh, in ES6, we've only got the fat arrow. We don't have the thin arrow. And I'll kind of get on to, the, to why that is in a minute. But the key thing to note here is that the function keyword has gone replaced with that, that kind of fat arrow, but also that the return is, is implicit. This is something that will be natural to you if you've worked in Ruby and a few other languages where you don't actually have to explicitly return. Just the last statement in that function is what gets returned, the last expression. Uh, and with arrow functions, it's exactly the same. So here I'm saying take x, double it, and just the last, the last thing in the arrow function will be returned when it's on one line like this. So this is just the, these, these two bits of code are achieving the same thing, but the second is kind of a much nicer syntax. There's also um, another difference with the arrow functions which are really important, and that's how the scoping works. So the problem that this slide is showing is a, is a fairly um, familiar one that most JavaScript developers, I think, come across at some point. So we have this object, which I've just called Jack. Uh, it's got a name, and it's got an array of friends. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have two whole friends uh, called James and Steve. And I have this print friends function. What it does is it goes over all the friends using the for each. Uh, I pass in a callback function. In that function, I'm just logging out this dot name, which should point to, to my name, Jack. Uh, then the string knows, and then the, the name of the friend. So I'm expecting this code when I call it to, to print out Jack knows James and Jack knows Steve. But the problem here, as you see down the bottom, is what this actually logs is undefined knows James and undefined knows Steve. And that's to do with the, the rules in which in what the scope is of a function when it's invoked. In this case, the function you pass into for each is going to be invoked such that its scope, the this keyword within that function, isn't the Jack object as we expect, but it's instead the global object. So if we're working in the browser, that would be the window. If we're working in uh, Node or IOJS, that would be the kind of root global object. And this is a really common problem, and it's probably one of the biggest ones that stumps uh, beginners to the language. And then it's all to do with the rules of how, how, what the scope is of a function, and depending on how it's invoked. Thankfully, arrow functions um, kind of take this problem away. I can write the same code and just simply swap out the, the function keyword like I had over here for my arrow function. And what this does is it, it, it has what's called lexical scoping. What this effectively means is that the scope when the function is called is the same scope that the function was defined in. So this time, because we're defining this function within the print friends function of the jack object, which is a, a fair mouthful, the, the this here is kind of bound to the jack object. So when for each goes over each element and it calls this function, the scope of that function is the object. So what this means is this time we can do this.name just like we did before, but the, the fat arrow function has, um, has kind of kept that scope. So we now get jack knows James and jack knows Steve. If you like browse Stack Overflow for a few minutes, I'm almost certain you'll, you'll find an unanswered question on this. The, these kind of pop up all the time, and the arrow functions are really um, kind of solving this. As I mentioned before, this has been really uh, motivated by CoffeeScript, which provided this, this fat arrow function, which does the exact same job. It kind of deals with the scoping. Uh, so, so whilst most people say that arrow functions are equivalent to the function keyword, they almost are with the uh, addition that the, we have the, the fat arrow here, which does the scoping too. Cool, so moving on. Uh, I'm just gonna come out of full screen and check that I'm still in the Hangout and everyone can hear me, which we can. It's a bit weird yep. doing a talk and not seeing anything. So I'm just, just checking, I haven't lost everyone. Um, cool, so moving on. And yeah, so this is kind of the, the typical use case. Um, people come to JavaScript through something like jQuery or some other library. One of the first things a lot of people do is make kind of requests to, to APIs, maybe the Twitter API, Facebook, Instagram, whatever it may be. Uh, and we'll typically pass callbacks into like a get JSON function, which makes an HTTP request to get some data. And again, in here, this dot name isn't going to refer to Jack because of the, the scope when that callback function is called. Uh, but then I swap it out for an arrow function, and now this dot name does point to Jack as expected. Should also note the syntax of the, the arrow function. Earlier on, when I did the map example, I didn't have curly braces after the fat arrow. And that's because when the, uh, the arrow function is on one line, you don't need those braces. As soon as you want to split the fat arrow over multiple lines, you do need those, those braces. So here I need the curlies because this is over multiple lines. If I move the log onto the same line as the fat arrow, I could, I could omit the, the curly braces. 
Cool. So that that's our functions. I think they're one of the the kind of quick wins of of ECMAScript six. They're really nice not only for reading code where you're kind of mapping over things, maybe filtering or going for each, and you can use that more succinct syntax, but also for avoiding like having to do the typical pattern is var self equals this or var underscore this equals this to maintain that kind of reference to the correct scope. We can kind of avoid those and just use arrow functions, which is is really, really nice. A kind of bigger feature coming to, to JavaScript and ES6 is classes. Uh, some people have called these one of the worst features to come to JavaScript. Some people think they're really good. I kind of sit roughly uh, in the middle. I'll kind of try to explain why. So this is what a class would look like in JavaScript. Uh, I've gone for the stereotypical example of, of people. So I have a person class. It has a constructor, which takes a name and an age, sets the name and age properties. And then I define a method like about that just logs out the name and age. There's a few bits of interesting syntax going on in here, though. Uh, the first is that you'll notice this: the new definition for how I'm defining the, the functions, both constructor and about. There's no function keyword, there's no arrow. You just kind of enter the name, put, put parentheses, and then curly brackets, and it's defined like that. You don't have to, to type out function or any of that, uh, which, is, which is much nicer. It makes to find these things much quicker and, and less. You're less likely to slip up by like missing a trailing comma or missing a semicolon or just typing out these, these big, long function keywords, which do get kind of dull over time. It's just kind of less repeated keywords throughout the file, and just you can see more easily what's going on. Uh, so yeah, and now I've got arrows going through it. So we have the constructor, and this is what's called when when you do like uh, var jack equals new person, and you give that argument. This is going to go ahead and call the constructor. This is like the function that gets run when you first initialize an instance of this class, and then we have we can define other methods like about. Then we can use that by doing new person jack twenty two. That calls the constructor, and then call jack dot about to get jack twenty two, my name and age. This is all kind of fairly straightforward. The most important thing to know here is that under the hood, there isn't like a new inheritance system or class-based system. It's all using the prototypal system we're used to in JavaScript, but just kind of adding a nice syntactical sugar on top of it. I don't think this means that you should go ahead and replace your object literals with classes all over the place. I think there will be some cases where classes will, will lead your code being more readable and easier to work with. There are some cases where keeping it as, as kind of objects like we always have done pre-having classes is, is just as good as well. So it's kind of a case-by-case -case basis on when you would and wouldn't use these. Um, some people are just not going to use them at all. Some people love them. There's kind of, I think I sit kind of in the middle. There's, there's cases where they really work. If you're building quite a complicated uh, object that has to do quite a lot of things, building a class is probably going to help kind of structure that and, and let it kind of see what's going on. Other cases, it might just be a bit over the top and just a bit more than you might need. Uh, so we can have inheritance in this class system. Again, under the hood, it uses JavaScript's prototypes. There's not any anything new going on here. It's just a sugar. And it all kind of is, is fairly straightforward. We have a class son that extends person. Uh, we call the constructor. And what this is going to do is override the constructor on the, the person class. So when I, when I create a new instance of sun, it's going to call this constructor. Then I can call super, and that's going to call the, the method of the same name on the parent class. So calling super here with name and age is going to go ahead and call the constructor on the person class, passing in that name and age. Then I set an extra property. In this case, I've set this dot sun to equal true. Now if I create a new sun in, instead of creating a new person, you can see that uh, that I can still call that about method because that's defined on the person class and sun is inheriting from that. But I can also check this new property sun and it's set to true. OK, so that, that's classes. Uh, going on to object literals, uh, I showed you the new kind of way of defining functions in classes. And we have that too in object literals now. So there's no longer any need to do about colon function brackets and then the curly braces and the function definition. You just kind of omit that middle function keyword and just type about. Uh, again, just just you know, just slim down a bit. There's a there's a ton of big features in ES6. There's a ton of kind of small ones like arrow functions, and then there's a ton of just kind of very small improvements that I think will make quite a big difference when writing uh, the language. It's, it's a nicer developer experience when typing this stuff out, and this just works exactly as you would expect. And it's worth noting these aren't like the function. It's still just a regular function. It's not being defined with an arrow function or anything, so it's not getting into that additional scoping stuff. It's just a plain odd function without the function keyword. We can also do this really funky thing, which I um, still can't think of a good use case for, but I love the idea. And that is, if you define this function, uh, sorry, if you define a property within an object and wrap it in kind of in square braces, 
you can define it using kind of dynamic parts. So here I'm naming a property and I'm calling it hello, but then also giving it a, a function uh, which returns world, which I then immediately evaluate. So this is actually going to go ahead and define the property hello underscore world on the jack object and set it to 42. Uh, so by wrapping this this property in square braces, you can add kind of dynamic segments that will be that will be figured out when this object is defined. Uh, I'd love to hear if anyone can think of a really good use case later because I've struggled, but I really like the fact that this is in the language, and I, I'm sure there are useful cases. I just haven't come across one yet. Uh, I think it's just quite a quirky, nice feature too. Uh, another big one is template strings. Again, this is kind of one of the smaller features that I think just, just makes it much nicer to work with. We've all done that thing where you've got a string that you want to output um, onto the screen, and inside it, you've got to output the kind of the value of a variable. And you kind of have to take the string, wrap it in quotes, and then put a space, and then the plus, and kind of concatenate this variable, and then another plus, and then open the quotes again, and put some more text. And that just kind of gets quite dull, and it's difficult to read, uh, and it's kind of just frustrating to work with. It's just kind of boring. Um, thankfully, and now we're going to get this, these template strings. Instead of starting these strings with, with quotes, sing, either single or double quotes, we start with back ticks instead. Uh, and what this does is it, it gives us a whole lot of things. So we can, we can output kind of line breaks. So it's kind of difficult to show on a slide, but this will output over multiple lines. Um, we can also have multi-line strings. So again, difficult to show on a slide. But if you imagine after the with in the top right, there is actually, I've, in my editor, I've literally hit enter and I'm typing back ticks in ES6 on the line below. Uh, you can't do this currently in JavaScript, so this is a way to kind of structure these big multi-line strings in, in JavaScript, which is really nice, although difficult to represent on a slide. Uh, but more excitingly, we can have string interpolation. So if I've got a variable name set to Jack and age, which is 22, I'm kind of, I have this template string using back ticks, and then I can use the dollar and the curly braces to kind of insert the variables in, into the string. And this will return the string Jack is, is 22 years old. But it, what it will have done, it, it will have evaluated name and age and kind of put those into the string. You can have more than just variables in there too. You could have, a, you know, a, you could do 2 plus 2 within those curly braces. You could call a function. Uh, and just whatever that returns will be outputted into the string. If you come from a language like Ruby, uh, like I do, having this in Ruby is lovely. And not having it in JavaScript has been a real pain. So to have this now in the language is, is another kind of really small but really nice improvement that I think makes a big difference. Cool. So moving on uh, again to destructuring. This follows the theme of another kind of small addition, which is, is really useful. We've all done this as well and needed to do this. Say you've got an array of, of two properties and you want to pull out the first one into a variable called A and the second one into a variable called B. Before, in JavaScript, currently, there's, there's no real nice way to do this. You have, you have to do var A equals array and then index 0 and var B equals array at index 1. Instead, we can, we can do this destructuring. So we say var and then wrap it in square braces A comma B. Set that equal to the array uh, 1 comma 2. And all that does is it destructures the things into the array, into the, into the kind of relevant variable. So after running this, A is set to 1 and B is set to 2. So it's a really nice way to pull particular bits out of an array that you want to work with. We can also like leave blank spaces out, and those will get skipped. So if you've got something of, of 3 and you care about the first and last one, you can just leave what's called an array hole in the middle there just by putting an empty thing within commas and you'll still get A equals 1 and B equals 3, and the middle value 2 will be discarded. This also extends onto objects, too. So if we have an object with properties A and B, and we want to just grab a variable for each of those properties, we can just use curly braces instead. So we want to destructure things out of arrays, we use square braces. When we want to destructure things out of objects, we use curly braces. And as you see, this sets A to equal 2 and B to equal 3. I've used this quite a lot, and the, the one area I find this really useful is when you're dealing with responses from APIs. So often if, you, if you've made a query to a particular API, say the Instagram API, to get a bunch of pictures, those pictures have a load of properties on them, and you might only care about one or two. And kind of instead of having to pull those off manually, you can just use this destructuring to, grab, to, to very quickly and easily pull the bits you want off the object instead of having to kind of do that manually. So it makes code read really nicer, or rather much nicer, and uh, it's kind of a really succinct way of expressing what you want to do. It's just less lines of code to write, which is which is always a good thing. Uh, it's worth noting also that it, this kind of fails silently, so it doesn't error. So here I've, I've told it to pull the A and B properties off the object, but the object only has B set to 3. 
Uh, it doesn't error at me. It's not going to kind of blow up. It's just going to silently set A to undefined, set B to three, and move on. This is this is kind of the good behavior. I think it's the right way to do it. But it's just kind of worth worth being aware of. So you, so you know, uh, if you do get a random undefined value, it could be because of this. And this is what I said. This is kind of where the object destructuring becomes really useful. If I have a function get person, which is returning an object, and I, I want to get either one of those properties, or in this case, both of the properties often into variables, I can do it and express it really nicely on that line below. I think this really shows the, the usefulness, usefulness and power of, of destructuring, particularly for objects. Uh, I found I don't tend to use the array destructuring as much, um, but there have certainly been times where that's been really useful as well. Another, again, another kind of small addition is a uh, default function uh, argument values. Again, something we've really kind of been wanting for a while. In this case, if I have a getInfo function and it's got a, a, it takes an argument print, and if print's true, I'm going to log something to the screen. Else, I'm going to return a string. Uh, and and it, it said it just works kind of as you'd imagine. I set print, and in the in the definition for the function, I set it equal to false. That effectively means if print isn't supplied, just set it to false. It means you don't have to worry inside a function about doing if print, you know, if print uh, isn't is defined, then set it. It's just kind of done. It's expressed much not more nicely. Uh, this is this is a, a thing that other languages have had for a long time. It's nice to see JavaScript catching up for this one. Again, really, really useful. We can also do stuff like destructure the um, or kind of this is the dot 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 is called the spread operator and it's used to kind of take in any number of arguments and convert them into an arrays in this case. So here I'm, I've got a function length which is just going to return whatever the length of the thing that's given to it. But instead of in instead of making the length function take in an array of things, I can just use this this spread operator and what that says is this function takes in any number of arguments. By doing dot 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 nums, what happens is inside the function, whatever all the arguments that are passed in are converted into an array for me. So if in this length function nums is an array, so when I call it down here with the values one two three, uh, inside the length function I will have an array called in the variable nums of one two three. So it's a nice way of saying this function takes any number of arguments and then just getting them inside the function as an array. There's no more kind of doing array dot prototype uh, dot slice dot call brackets arguments on the on the arguments object to get an array of all the arguments. We can just use dot 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 instead. It's much cleaner and, and much nicer. It also serves as a handy shortcut to the case where you've got an array of, of arguments that you need to you need to pass in to another function that you want to call. So in this case, I have a total function that had, takes three arguments x, y, and z and just logs out the the uh, the total, the sum of them. And I can call it with one, two, three, and I'll get back six, and that's fine. Say I have an array of one, two, three, and I want to call the total function and take each of the items in the array and call it as, as one of the arguments to the total function. The current way to do this in JavaScript now is to use apply. The first argument to apply is the scope of the function. In this case, I've just used null. The second is an array where each one will be mapped onto one of the arguments of the function. Uh, that works and it's fine. It's kind of clear what's going on, but we can kind of use the, the spread operator to do the exact same thing. So this will call total and destructure, or rather spread each item in the array to be one argument to the function. Again, just just kind of nice and a, a nice way of expressing what you want to achieve. We can also kind of do some really cool stuff with destructuring now as well. So in this case, I've written a function foo which is expected to be called with an object with two properties in name and age. You see at the top here where I've defined it, I've given it the, uh, the curly brackets around the name and age arguments. And this is basically going to use a combination of, of kind of, it's going to use destructuring. So basically when I, when I call foo with an object that has name and age properties, it's going to pull out the name and age properties and make them available to me as variables within the function. So this is a really nice way as well for if you're looking at a function you want to know You've got a function that takes an object, and you want to know what properties it particularly cares about. When the function is defined like, like foo is here, it's very easy as a developer to look at the source and see what properties you're expected to pass in. And it just saves kind of pulling name and age off the object that you're given and, and doing stuff with them. You could just really easily express, I want, to, I want to take in an object, and it should have the name and age properties on them. And inside, I can get at those just as variables, and that's really, really useful. So back on to, to scope, and one of the bigger changes to JavaScript coming in in ES6 or ES2015 
Uh, currently in JavaScript, there are two scopes. There's a global scope, which is the window object if we're in browser world, and function scope. So if at the top level we have a variable foo, but we miss out the var keyword, that goes onto the global scope, as does here the var fad, because that's also defined in the global scope. Uh, within my function, if I define bar to be three and miss out the var keyword, bar also gets added to the global scope. And then within my function, var bas equals four goes onto the function scope. And traditionally, this kind of missing of the var keyword has been um, has, has caused a lot of bugs. It's very easy for something to float up onto the global scope where you didn't mean it to. When this gets confusing, particularly for beginners new to the language, is if you define a variable within a, a block, like within an if condition or in a loop. So here within this function, I've said if x of our foo equals 3. But when foo gets defined, it doesn't get defined within just the, the braces of that conditional, within the block scope. It gets defined within the, the function scope. So here var foo and var baz are both defined on the same level. And this kind of, once you know the rules around, around how JavaScript does scoping and it's just function and global, this is, it's easy to see what's going on here. But it's kind of unintuitive. Uh, and it is easier to kind of work with, just less prone to, to errors. What we're going to get in ES6 is a new scope, which is called block scope. So now, instead of using the var keyword, I'm going to use the let keyword within this if kind of x conditional. And what that means uh, is that the y now is only available within the block. And here, when I say block, I really mean anything uh, with, with curly braces around it. So here, inside that if x conditional, there is a block. And because I've used the let keyword, that binds y to only be available in that block scope. If I'd used the var keyword, it would be available in the function scope. But the let keyword defines things at a block level. And this becomes really nice. So there you go. You see there, if I use var z equals 3 and let y equals 2, z goes up onto the function scope, let stays on the block scope. What I think this is really going to do is just kind of uh, solve a lot of bugs where variables end up in the scope you didn't really imagine them to be in. Uh, the way I see this going is once kind of the ES6 is out and natively implemented across most browsers, is people should start using let um, by default. The var keyword shouldn't really be used. I think it should only be used in kind of legacy code, and over time you can kind of transition to using var instead, uh, sorry, to using let instead of var, and kind of replacing your old vars with lets. Uh, for kind of new code, when, when this stuff comes out and is readily available in all browsers, you should be using let from, from the get-go. Modules. So one of the areas JavaScript has particularly struggled in is in that there's never been a module system native to the language. There have been implementations like Browserify, which let us kind of use the Node.js or the CommonJS uh, specification in the browser. That works really well. There's uh, libraries like RequireJS, um, which use the AMD specification to kind of give us a module system in the browser. And again, that, that works pretty well. It's, it's a really good library. But they've all had drawbacks because they haven't really been implemented natively. And what happened really is when Node really became popular and it, it kind of it brought with it the CommonJS syntax, the module.exports, and the var x equals require x syntax. And it was clear that, that that worked really well. It's been really well embraced, and, and kind of no developers love working with it. I find that module system in Node really, really good. And that's kind of led the, the inspiration for developing a module system for the browser, too. Uh, it takes on this similar-ish um, approach to, to Node. You can kind of tell that one was inspired by the other, but there are, there are some pretty big differences. It also makes heavy use of the destructuring that we saw earlier, and you'll kind of recognize the syntax from that. So here I've got two files. I've got app.js and foo.js. In app.js, I've got two variables, foo and bar. At the bottom, I'm using the export keyword to export foo and bar. And these are what we call a named export. App.js has two named exports. One is called foo, the other is called bar. We can also do this kind of inline. So back here, I have var foo equals two, var bar equals three, and I use that export curly braces syntax. If you want to just create a variable and export it straight away, you can you can chuck the export uh, onto the beginning of the line like so, and that has exactly the same effect. But, and I'll, uh, sorry, I didn't realize I didn't need to skip on quite there. And you can see down the bottom in foo.js, I'm importing it, and again using the curly bracket syntax. So here I'm saying in foo.js, you can read this as import the named export foo from app. Uh, and you don't need the .js extension on the end. That's added for you. And I can console.log foo, and I'll get two. Along with named exports, modules can also have what's called a default export. 
So here in app.js, I'm exporting a default export, which in this case happens to be a function. It could just be a number uh, or an object, anything at all, that returns two. Inside foo.js, I can import it, but the crucial difference here is that I don't use the, the curly brackets around it. And this is because I'm not getting it a named export. I'm just getting at the default export for app.js. And down here where I've got import foo, I can name that whatever I want. App.js doesn't named it, uh, sorry, doesn't name it, so you can just name it anything you'd like. And then I can call that in foo.js and I get two. Um, and what we also have, what's important to note is that app.js uh, could export both a default export and named exports. The kind of easy way to think of this, if you imagine a library like underscore or, or the alternative lodash, these are kind of utility libraries. They might have a default export, which is the entire underscore object, but they might have named exports for every single one of the functions they provide. So it's perfectly fine for, having, for things to have a default export and a bunch of named exports too. There's also this different syntax, although actually looking at this slide, I'm not entirely sure if this has survived the spec and is still in there. So I will have to check that and clarify. Um, but if it is, this, this lets you kind of get at all the named exports in one go. But as I say, I think the syntax may have changed slightly since I wrote this slide deck, so I will clarify that uh, shortly. So that's the module syntax, and I could do an entire talk on uh, modules, and what I plan to do after this, this kind of presentation is I'll put a blog post out with a ton of links to kind of resources and further reading. So if there's any bits of this that you kind of want to read more about, I'll, I'll be publishing a blog post hopefully in the next couple of days with a ton of links. Uh, one of the things that's coming as well is generators, and these do a, a ton of really cool things. They kind of let us, they kind of provide a way of, of almost working infinitely. So we can calculate kind of massive numbers, say like the 2000 Fibonacci number because of the way generators work. They kind of, they let you drop, they let you jump through each step to, to kind of generate these big numbers. But what I, and there's a ton of blog posts on that that I'll link to, but what I'm more excited about is generators potentially let us work with asynchronous code as if it was synchronous. So this is kind of a typical example from, in this case, Nodeland, where uh, I'm using some 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 uh, some module to connect to my database and query for things. So in this case, I'm finding a person with an ID of five, and I've got a callback function that, that is called with that person. And once I've got that person, say, I need to find their location. So I use location.find one again, and that has a callback that takes in the location. This quickly gets into kind of nesting uh, and what's called callback hell. We have functions that take a callback, and inside there they call another function that takes a callback and so on and your code kind of quickly veers off to the right-hand side of the screen. Promise is a one way to solve that, uh, which I'm not actually going to cover today. But another potentially when working with asynchronous code is, is generators. So this, um, this kind of doesn't work, important to note, magically out of the box. The library that you're using needs to have support for this. But potentially, if you're using a library that does support, we can instead use this yield keyword. And what you can see here is I've suddenly got what reads as synchronous codes of so our person equals yield person dot find one with whatever arguments and var lock equals yield location dot find one. And, and as you're reading this, you can read this synchronously because it is line after line. But what the yield keyword is doing here is basically yielding to that and just waiting for it to respond. And when it responds, it comes back and assigns the, the right data to the person variable. So again, this, this does rely on the library supporting it, but potentially, and I think libraries will support it, um, a couple already do, or kind of do in like beta mode or, or testing, uh, is you can you can like write this asynchronous code, but as if it was synchronous. Synchronous code is much easier to reason about. When you've got five lines and you know that they happen one after the other when the previous line has finished executing, that's much easier to reason about when you've got kind of five nested callback levels deep of, of stuff going on. So I'm really kind of interested to see how that develops. I think a lot of libraries will support that in the future. So that's kind of a run through of some of the year six features. Um, I could go on for hours and hours about all the other features. Unfortunately, can't fit them all in. As I said, I'll kind of write a blog post with a ton of links after the event as well. Uh, but in terms of using this stuff today, I really want to encourage you to, to go and have a play with this. There are solutions which I'm about to talk about which let you use all this stuff today uh, in the browsers in actual production apps, and it works really, really well. As I said, uh, where I work, we, we have an app that runs ES6. Uses the ES6 modules, arrow functions, the spread operator, destructuring, template strings, a whole load of stuff, and we just run it for a tool that kind of converts it into JavaScript that will run in, in today's browsers. You can head, uh, if I hide this thing at the bottom, oh, I didn't go well. Oh, I think I've just quit Keynote. No, there we go. No? 
What is going on here? Sorry about this. Oh, there we go. We'll go back. Um, I'll put a link in the chat in a minute. If you had to, there's a, uh, a person called Kangax on GitHub maintains a compatibility table, which kind of shows you all the features of VS6 and how they are supported in um, both browsers like Chrome, Firefox, IE, and so on, but also in, in tools like Tracer and, and others, which I'll mention in a minute. So this is kind of the, the best place to go and see where the kind of features are and what's implemented in what browsers. And after the talk, I'll, I'll drop a link in the chat. Uh, you can also head into, into Chrome and go to Chrome Flags and look for the Enable JavaScript Harmony uh, hashtag, and that will kind of turn on a bunch of features that, that is kind of in Chrome but not, not in the kind of main default uh, implementation yet. That lets you play with a lot of things like in the Chrome Developer Console. But there's also tools um, that effectively transpile your JavaScript from ES6 down into ES5. So they take JavaScript written in UAS6, it uses like classes, destructuring, uh, arrow functions, whatever it may be, and compiles that into code that, that doesn't use that stuff. It basically uses JavaScript that is natively implemented across all the main browsers today. So you can write in your editor ES6 uh, and then run in the browser ES5. Uh, Tracer is one such tool. It's backed by Google. Um, really kind of works well. The compatibility table here does even have a column for Tracer, so you can see exactly what features you can start working with today. And that basically just provides like a command line tool that takes your, your input file and spits out a new file with it all converted into ES5. Uh, if you run Node, you can use the dash dash harmony flag to get at a load of features, um, a load of ES6 features that aren't quite unstable yet. If you have moved on to the bandwagon of IOJS, there's a lot more ES6 supported by default in IO.js. So if, you, if you're kind of working on server side where you want to use this stuff, potentially look at IO.js. Uh, I haven't used it, so I can't, I can't vouch for it. But it, one of the first things they did when they split off from Node was just upgrade the, um, the version of WebKit Node uses, or rather, sorry, IO uses. So they kind of gained a bunch of ES6 features off the back of doing that. There's also Babel, or Babel, um, which was known previously as 6 to 5.js, now called uh, Babel, Babel, I still can't decide. And this is like Tracer, it's another tool that takes ES6 code and converts it to ES5 code. The kind of main difference between them is that Tracer doesn't care about the readability of the output. If you, if you give Tracer some ES6, the output is probably going to be kind of mangled, which you're probably not going to be able to work with it or read through it. Whereas uh, th this tool tries to make the output code as close to the code you would have written in real life as possible. So it's a bit easier to kind of read and, and follow through with. I think their feature support is mostly equivalent. There's probably a couple of, of kind of um, where one supports some feature that the other doesn't, but they're mostly on the, the same kind of level. And yeah, we use Tracer in our project to kind of compile all the ES6 into ES5, and it, it does work kind of really well. And in terms of the ES6 modules, um, the best way to get started with this is a tool by Guy Bedford called System.js. And System.js is a universal module loader for JavaScript. That means it can take modules written in uh, ES6 syntax, the new syntax I showed you earlier, uh, AMD, which is the syntax required JS uses, and CommonJS, which is the, the syntax Node uses, and load them all in in the browser and kind of makes it all work and has a bunch of very clever code that I can never hope to understand um, that, that kind of makes all that possible. So this is what we use, and basically what this means is we write all our code using ES6 modules, and System.js is responsible for kind of polyfilling in new features that will be in ES6 but aren't yet to make all this stuff work in the browser today. It's even, if you, you also install the ES6 module loader, which is a dependency of System.js, and you can have all your, your ES6 modules loaded in it as well. So it works really, really nicely, and I would really recommend if you're starting a new JavaScript project, to kind of use ES6 modules. System.js, it sounds almost too good to be true, the, the how it works, but it really does work really seamlessly and, and really nicely. And ES6 modules, that spec is finalized. The kind of import and export syntax isn't going to change. Uh, so now is a really good time to kind of pick this up, use ES6 modules, use like System.js to make it all work. And then when this stuff is natively implemented in the browsers you need to, to support, you can just remove that entire dependency and everything else will, will work as is. The kind of spec has been confirmed, so you don't have to worry about major changes there. But I'd really, really recommend using ES6 modules uh, today. They're by far away the nicest solution, and particularly with like such a good library like System.js behind you, you'll, you'll really, uh, you hopefully should find it a really nice, seamless experience. 
as I said, uh, I had a fairly short amount of time, and there's so much into ES6 that I couldn't hope to cover it all. Um, there's things like maps coming, sets, proxies, promises, which I didn't even mention, which is kind of a unified standard for, for promises, which is really nice. Uh, there's also module loaders, APIs, so as long as we're doing the import and export syntax, you can also like, do system.import to, to import a file and, and stuff like that. So there's a whole ton of stuff there too. Lots of APIs are working with uh, numbers and strings, just those object kind of APIs are getting a bunch of new functions, which will be really nice, a lot of new utility methods, which will just kind of save time. Uh, and as I said, I'll kind of link to a few blog posts and things, because there's, there's a lot of stuff going into ES6, and we're really, really, really excited about it, but couldn't possibly hope to cover it all. Uh, yeah, so that's it. I hope that was kind of an interesting uh, run through of some of the kind of features that I'm most excited about at a kind of fairly high level. Um, I guess we have time. I didn't go on for too long, so we do have some time for questions and things. Um, but but yeah, that, that's me, I guess. That's my awesome. Great. Thank you so much, Jack. That was very, very in-depth. Um, so yeah, uh, everyone everyone viewing in, feel free to throw any questions that you have uh, into the group chat and we'll hit them. Um, I also have some that were emailed in. Um, or to start, it looks like Joanne just cool, threw one Joanne, in. Yeah. Um, if you use Babel, do you still need System.js for module loading? Uh, you do, yes. So so Babel is, is doing effectively the same thing as Tracer in that it takes ES6 and converts it to ES5. Um, System.js kind of just deals with loading in modules in a bunch of different syntaxes. Uh, System.js comes with support for Babel as well as Tracer. You can kind of pick whichever one you'd prefer and it, it will work with both. Awesome. Um, I've got some that were emailed into us. So, I mean, you sort of hinted at this a little bit, but, you know, when when do you think ES6 will be widespread enough that we'll be seeing you know all people that are utilizing you know JavaScript taking advantage of it? Uh, it's re it's really tricky to say. Um, I think this is the first release that I've ever been in well not involved with but kind of been following along with where the the tools like Tracer and things have sprung up so quickly and gained a lot of popularity very quickly. I think it shows that a lot of people are really really excited about about ES6 and the kind of additions it adds. Um, so, like most people working on big JavaScript apps now, should absolutely be be using ES6 through something like Trace or, or Babel. Particularly if you only have to support a newer set of browsers, um, then you kind of have a lot less risk there. In terms of it being natively supported, um, it's as I said, very difficult to say. There's so many different features uh, across so many different features across so many different browsers. Um, bits are being implemented in browsers today. I know Google Chrome. They've got a fair few um, implemented either in stable or behind a flag or in their canary version. They've got a lot more. Uh, similarly, I think Firefox are pretty up to date and, and trying to implement stuff, but there's still there's still a lot more missing. There's no native ES6 modules implementation yet, for example. Um, but I know some. I think Chrome Chrome behind a flag definitely supports arrow functions. It may even be in stable. I can't quite remember it. This stuff moves so quickly that it's very hard to keep up with it. But it's difficult to say. It's definitely not going to be like a couple of months. It'll probably be more like six, 12 months at least. Um, but yeah, the, the tools are really keeping up to date. So you can certainly use this stuff through tools like now, today. When it comes to like ditching those tools and using it all natively, that's we're still a, a fair way off there, I would right. say. But yeah, very difficult to predict that kind of thing. <laughs> gotcha. Um, so a few people actually emailed in. Obviously, this is before they, they got to view your talk, but uh, some people were interested in the similarity to TypeScript. Um, so you know, how how do you see ES6 and TypeScript as being similar or dissimilar? Um, so I confess to not having used TypeScript yet in a project. Um, so if there's anyone who knows TypeScript better than me, please feel free to correct me if I get stuff wrong. But um, so yeah, TypeScript, part of what TypeScript provides at the moment is a lot of the, the ES6 features, I believe. So I think like if you if you write some TypeScript, you can use arrow functions, for example, and it will convert that back into, into JavaScript when it kind of compiles that stuff. The way I see it evolving is TypeScript will just stay around but add the things that the ES6 doesn't cover. Um, the most obvious one being kind of types uh, and, and any kind of additions like that, annotations, I think they're going to add as well, and a few new things. Effectively, I think TypeScript will stay as a tool that adds that stuff, but then they won't need to add all the extra features like arrow functions and whatnot because ES6 will just kind of cover that for you. So this does, certainly doesn't mean the end of, of things like TypeScript at all. One of the interesting things about the ES6 uh, kind of goals was that one of its big goals was to make JavaScript better as a target language to compile to. 
as in they want to make JavaScript more friendly for people who want to build new languages like TypeScript, CoffeeScript, uh, that kind of thing. So, so really it's being encouraged that you should write your code in, in not JavaScript and have it converted to JavaScript. So that, that kind of whole um, breed of, of additions like TypeScript certainly isn't going to go anywhere at all. Gotcha. Um, yeah, wow, a lot of people are interested in how it's re related to TypeScript. Um, uh, you know, one other sort of broader thing some, some people were were wondering about was, you know, if you're about to start a new project and you're looking at all your options in terms of, uh, in terms of functionality of different JavaScript tools, you know, what would make you start a project dead set on using ES6? Um, so for me, it would be, the, the to be honest, the only thing would be if I, what kind of browsers I needed to support. Um, again, I don't know this for sure because I'm quite fortunate that at work we, we get to target quite new browsers and I don't, all my side projects I never worry about like IE6 uh, for obvious reasons. But I think the thing to check there uh, would be kind of what level of browsers that things like Tracer and Babel support. So if they support kind of, I don't think they do, but say they were support down to, to i6, then that would be great. You could kind of use it for all projects. Um, I believe that I'm just looking on, on Chrome, and I don't believe Tracer works in i8, maybe not even i9. I think it might be i10 and up. So really the, the main problem there is if you're using like Tracer or Babel, or even something like TypeScript or similar, the, the main problem there is what languages, sorry, what browsers they support with their outputted code. Um, but in terms of, if I was starting like a side project in JavaScript that I only cared about working in the newer version of browsers, I would absolutely use this, this stuff today, um, kind of without a doubt. Although a lot of it isn't implemented, kind of the, a lot of the specs are confirmed, so you can write code now and know that the entire spec isn't going to change and the syntax isn't going to change. Um, and it just kind of gets you in a nice position where you're kind of ahead of the curve a little bit. Gotcha. Uh, Joanne just wrote in, uh, wouldn't the transpiled code by ES5, and it'll work in a... Oh. Uh, so this is relating to the Babel question, right? So um, e yeah, I'm pretty sure that... Um, I know the way I can, I, I, as I said, I haven't used Babel, so I'd need to clarify, but I believe it might work in the same way as Tracer in this regard, whereas, um, so I can definitely speak for Tracer, I can't speak for Babel because I haven't used it yet. We use Tracer, and, and effectively what it does is when it takes all this module syntax, it compiles it into a new syntax that uses uh, an API called system dot register and then system.import. And this is the other side. There are two parts of the ES6 module spec. The one that I talked about in the talk, which is the import and export syntax. Uh, there's also another side, which is this new kind of loader API that I very, very briefly mentioned. And this lets you call like system.import in JavaScript to load in an additional module. Um, so when Tracer compiles ES6 module code down, it uses uh, another API called system.register. What it's effectively lets you do is register a module. So I can say system.register foo and give it a function. And then later on I can do import foo. And now instead of going to make like an HTTP request to get that module, because I use system.register, it can just go and grab that function and execute that. Um, system.register and system.import aren't supported yet in browsers. They will be further down the line, uh, as with all the ES6, ES6 stuff. But what system system.js does is it provides those for us. It kind of polyfills the system.register and system.import commands. So you do still need to, to have system.js hanging around with the compiled trace or code, I believe. Um, I certainly know that's how we do it on our application. So we, we compile stuff down, but it still uses the system API, and system.js provides that for us. Gotcha. Um, so, so yeah, so part of system.js is just a polyfill for this new API that doesn't exist yet, but will. Cool. Uh, VJ, who's in the other room, just sent in a question. Um, I'm using the Q&A app here. Uh, uh, where can we find the latest happenings of ES6, the progress of the standards and the roadmap, things like that? Um, oh, that's a good question. So the main blog I follow on this, uh, I'm just going to put a link into the compatibility table while I remember to mention it, because I said I would, um, is the uh, this, this blog... Um, by uh, Dr. Axel, I'm really sorry, I'm going to absolutely destroy this pronunciation, Rauschmeier, Rauschmeier. Um, I'm sorry, Axel, if you're, if you're listening. So 
uh, Axel is, is fantastic at kind of keeping up to date with the spec and stuff. You can go and follow, there's um, ES Discuss, which is kind of a forum where a lot of the implementation details of ES6 are discussed in kind of detail by the people kind of leading it. Uh, but a lot of that is kind of quite difficult to read. It's very, very in-depth. If you're not too familiar with the spec, it's quite difficult to follow. Um, Dr. Axel Rauschmeier kind of puts posts out um, just after the event, kind of writing about the new syntaxes and what's happening. So um, if you kind of look at his ES6 content here, uh, he's got a ton of, of posts about the latest kind of specification changes. Once the spec is confirmed, he tends to write big posts about, about the spec. So for example, this post here, uh, I don't know, am I still sharing my screen? Uh, you are, yeah. Yeah, so th this post here on the ES6 modules syntax is kind of the go-to guide I'd point people to for a really in-depth look at the ES6 um, kind of module syntax. And there are similar posts on this blog for, for all the other syntaxes, classes, um, generators, and so on. So really, uh, following uh, Dr. Axel on, on Twitter and subscribing to this blog, which is tuality.com, uh, you know, I'll try and put a link in, it's kind of how I would keep up to date. That's the best kind of uh, written in kind of a really easy to understand and digest way. Like very in-depth, but, but written in a, a way that's nice to, to kind of follow. Awesome. Oh, I put the link in twice. That's how good it is. <laughs> Check it out twice. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, everyone else, uh, please feel free to ask any other questions. Um, I covered really the, the popular ones we were sent in. Um, Jack, someone did just comment actually on the Code Mentor landing page for this session, wondering if you would share the slides for this. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Maybe we can. We'll get that link later, and I'll, I'll send it to everyone afterwards. Um, yeah, if, if anyone had any other questions, otherwise, um, you know, Jack, where's uh, other other than Twitter? Are there some other resources people should check out your work, um, where you're blogging about what you're doing or anything like that? Uh, I guess it would just be JavaScriptPlayground.com. Uh, is it? I can never remember. I've got no. It's not there. So yeah, JavaScriptPlayground.com is kind of where I blog about a ton of this stuff. Um, I've written recently about promises, uh, ES6 classes, ES6 destructuring. Uh, modules and dependencies with JSPM and System.js, uh, arrow functions and more. So kind of this is where I'm kind of writing most of my stuff about about ES6. Uh, it's kind of a gen general JavaScript blog, but most of the content these days tends to be ES6 focused. Awesome. You think you'll do a, a, any any more published book work on ES6? Uh, probably not on ES6. Um, particularly, actually, the uh, the Dr. Axel behind the Tuality blog is currently writing a book on ES6. Um, which is at exploringjs.com. Uh, uh, I believe this will be free. Yeah, it will be. It'll be free online. You can buy kind of PDF and print versions. But this will be kind of the go-to resource. I don't. I don't really see any point in, mm -hmm. in writing one myself because really he'll he'll cover absolutely everything. So I'd really recommend checking this out as well. I'll put another link in the chat for that. Awesome. Well, everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. I know this was a, uh, a pretty technical session, and all, what's great is that all of this is recorded live to YouTube, so you can go back, uh, re-listen, and watch to, to Jack walking you guys through all, all those slides. I, I know I definitely uh, will be checking them out a couple more times. Um, but, uh, yeah, Jack, thank you so much for your time today, and um, if, if anyone is working on any projects they need any ES6 or JavaScript help with, obviously Code Mentor is at your disposal. There's a lot of great experts listed there um, and I'll also be sending you guys a link to Jack's slides afterwards um, so if there aren't any other questions let me just double check no one from the other room has typed any other ones in looks like we covered them all for right now oh actually one more just popped in oh. if, we, if we have an extra second um, yeah. squeeze it in last minute as long as um, it's easy yeah uh, <laughs> Chetan I, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing the name um, is wondering could you share your debugging workflow while developing with ES6 are there any special settings um, all you need to do is, I believe this will happen by default, is uh, is make sure you're kind of working with source maps. So um, I'm pretty sure Tracer and Babel support maps, and thankfully uh, I debug all my stuff in, in Google Chrome, and the, the console there, the dev tools there are really good at, at working with source maps. So if you get an error, you can kind of, and you've got it all enabled, uh, there's tons of tutorials on kind of enabling source maps and the, the dev tools and making it all hook up correctly. It's fairly straightforward. You can just kind of click. It will say like error line 42, but that will actually map to like line 20 of your actual code. But you can kind of click that, and it will take you to the the kind of pre-compile code. So it's um, as long as you've got source maps going, and as I said, lots of resources online about getting those set up. It's it's actually really nice and very. Yeah. Now and then there is kind of a, a problem where you might just have the error and it might point you in the wrong wrong direction. 
Um, but on the whole, actually, Source Maps kind of gets you 95% of the way there. Awesome. Um, great. Well, yeah. Thank you so much, Jack. Thank you guys for tuning in. And um, you know, if you're if you're interested, we're doing actually a whole like month and a half of uh, what we're calling our JavaScript framework series. So if you go to Code Mentor's Office Hours link uh, from the homepage, we're doing tons and tons of JavaScript uh, meetings with experts like Jack um, for the next couple months. So uh, definitely worth checking that out. And uh, with that, I'll say good afternoon, good evening it, to Jack in London. Good morning if you're somewhere else in the world. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> have uh, have a great one. Cool. Thank you guys for coming. Thanks for having me, Mark. Yeah. Thanks so much.